yeah, El Salvador does that. It changes a lot of your perspectives of, of things and mostly the people. Yeah. Uh, in general, people is are are so good, so welcoming, so friendly, uh, so helping. And that helps a lot, of course, because the place can be really good. But if the people are not yeah. friendly, well, you won't feel you won't feel welcomed. The overall message is you should be really proud now of your country, of being a Salvadoran, because tables are turning. Uh, we Latin Americans or even Salvadorans used to go try or want to go out of the country. And now these people are wanting to come in. So you should be proud of that. You should feel proud of being a Salvadoran and work for that dream. Uh, whatever you want to do, it's really possible. Now, now you are on a point in time where you can decide what you want to do. And there are a lot of opportunities if you take them because things are not for free. We are live here from Bitcoin Beach with none other than Paco. I've been working with Paco for forever, and I, I don't think he has a last name. He just doesn't need it. He's like uh, Madonna or you know, Sting. <laughs> he just needs that first name. So uh, one of these days, I'm going to sneak a peek at his ID and see what his, uh, his, his real name actually yeah. is. But he is known as Paco here on the Bitcoin Beach team. He right. has... Uh, recently become a real integral part of what we're doing here. I think I first met you, you were helping Max and Stacy out, right? Yes, um, correct. And I don't know how that transpired. Share with us a little bit of your story. How did a Mexican citizen wind up here in El Salvador? What has been your journey? And uh, how did you become a member of the Bitcoin Beach team? Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited of doing this. And yeah, well, mm, the story starts with COVID, basically, because uh, my former business got shot with the lockdowns or with all the travel restrictions around the world. I think you had like a music tour yeah, business or something? A, a travel company that would dedicate this business to f music festivals and sports uh, around the world. All the things that were shut down during oh, COVID. Everything, everything that got <laughs> shut down basically stopped yeah. and so my business really uh, overnight stopped for like for good and that took me really into thinking about many things that I would use I wouldn't be used to thinking in terms of uh, money really uh, I didn't understand actually how money worked even though I had a successful business but uh, it didn't make me understand really how money works so it took me really fast into the knowledge and that rabbit hole of money printing, for example. And um, like, what was your first exposure in that? Were you just like in the middle of COVID thinking, what are we going to do? And then somebody yeah. started introducing Bitcoin to you or how, how did that come into play where yeah. that made you think in that direction? Yeah, um, basically, I thought uh, this is not going to come back soon. And even if it comes back, it's something to it's going to be a little weird. Uh, not something that I would like to come back to or to return to. So me and my brother were business partners. And so we started thinking, what are we going to do with the little money that we had before? Because we had some savings and also because a, a lot of our business, uh, we used to prepay a lot of stuff of uh, plane tickets and of uh, festival tickets. So but none of them refunded any of that oh, money. Wow. So all of that money was gone. Yeah. So we were like basically broke by that time with a little bit of savings. And uh, we were like, we need to do something about it. Uh, so we started studying, understanding about money. Some series in YouTube, Mike Maloney, actually. Mike Ma I remember perfectly because Mike Maloney took me to Max Kaiser in, indirectly. Started, uh, he has like a very cool series about money, about how money works. So I was like, what is this true? I mean, do they really print money like this? I, I couldn't believe it, really. Uh, so that really took me into uh, understanding how gold works, silver. In Mexico, it's very easy to buy silver. 
Uh, so we bought silver as a protection. Well, first we bought dollars as a protection. <laughs> and then I, I said, well, no, dollars are not really that good. But then we bought uh, silver. And after that, in some of the chapters of that series, uh, Mike Maloney interviews Max Kaiser. So that's how I got into knowing who Max Kaiser was, starting uh, listening to him talking about Bitcoin. And so that took me to the Kaiser Report. So I started learning about Bitcoin. We were like, what is this thing? It's going to be another Ponzi scheme. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm afraid. Also, part of our background, we had a, a, a bit of uh, problems, with, legal problems with the company, people trying to sue us or to steal money from us. So it's like uh, everything co uh, compounded into uh, being like... Uh, having a bad feeling about having doing business or some people that would try to steal from yeah. you or do wrong worried about scammers and scammers yeah. and stuff like that yes correct so um that it, it took really like a couple of months maybe that i started understanding more about bitcoin and there was nothing for us to do we were like one year with nothing to do absolutely nothing to do we couldn't leave i mean the country mexico overall was open but for us, we were living there. We, it, for us, it was, we can do anything yeah. about this. So um, it took me like two or three months, basically, studying about Bitcoin. And we were like, you know what? Let's just buy some and do some, understand more, see what happens. Because obviously, the volatility was our first uh, doubts, our first fears also. So he was, he, me and my brother were like, let's buy some, let's figure out how to buy it and see what happens. Was it easy to, to buy it in Mexico? Yeah, very or? easy, very okay. easy. Bitso is an exchange in uh -huh. Mexico and it's a, the largest in Latin America, actually. And uh, we, so you just open an account with them yeah. and you could transfer from your bank account Correct. to there. Okay. Yeah, it was super easy. Uh, KYC, a lot of KYC, but at that point we didn't understand much about KYC yeah. or all that stuff. Uh, so it was easy. It was really easy. And learning more and more about it and more and more and more uh, understanding about uh, Bitcoin and very, getting really very deep into the economics part. But then learning, listening to a lot of podcasts and a lot of reading, a lot of things, I got into the philosophical part of Bitcoin, not the technical part. So I loved it. I loved the freedom part, the responsibility, the sovereignty, all of that aspects like really hit hard with me because I was uh, somehow uh, distraught with what's been happening, right? Uh, so by me, uh, beginnings of 2021, when they announced the Bitcoin conference in Miami, I decided I, I wanted to go. I mean, I could, I was able to go from Mexico. There was no requirement for vaccination for Mexicans at that point. So I was like, okay, I can go. It's easy. So I went and in Miami, I met Max and Stacy. So from there, I don't know how, but I started like we, we made friends. Yeah. We started talking. Uh, we got along very well. And uh, we started just like uh, hanging around in Miami. I, I was hanging around with them, going to every place. And we started organizing the, the parties, the, the Elon Musk parties, if you remember. So I started helping them. I'm, I'm, I don't remember that. What, what were the Elon One, Musk parties? Uh, yeah, after in the conference in Miami, uh -huh. it was uh, uh, the same time when Elon Musk started uh, talking bad about Bitcoin. Ah, okay. So, so yeah. So Max, of course, started saying, "No, Elon, Elon sucks." Basically, <laughs> right? So we started doing all these parties uh, in Phoenix, then in Houston. No, in Houston, not in Austin. Okay. And the last one actually was in El Sonte. Because we, uh, when the Bitcoin in Miami, during, during the Bitcoin conference in Miami, we heard about uh, the law. Uh, Jack Mallers was announcing we were there. And so it was like, El Salvador, what? What is this? I mean, I've heard of El Salvador before because of my history classes of the Spaniards and of the independence of all Central America, Mexico, etc. But I really wasn't, I didn't know about El Salvador anything at all, really. Did, I'm, I'm curious because I've seen in general, and, and maybe this is too broad of a generalization, but in, in general, um, 
and, ha- and how do I say this without offending people? Uh, it, in general, it seems like Mexicans have have historically kind of looked down on Central Americans sure. as like, you know, they're much more developed. The Central Americans are kind of, you know, way behind, um, kind of seen as almost like a lower class that that they're just not the developed nation or the economic power that Mexico is. So in, in the past, I have a lot of Mexican friends um, and they've always kind of, spoken a little bit disparagingly of Guatemalans or Salvadorans and that sort of thing. So as kind of coming from that environment, did it seem weird to you that like this was coming out of El Salvador? Um, It was not weird. Uh, I didn't have really these uh, aspects of looking down into Central America. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, I know. I know. And I agree because actually Mexico is a very racist country uh, within their own indigenous people. So I, I, I don't have doubts about that. Uh, what I was, uh, in my case, I really didn't know anything. I didn't have either a positive nor yeah. a negative uh, uh, opinion. Uh, but when I when they said announce the law and uh, we were talking and so we're, we were like, let's do a party. And at the same time, they announced the conference adopting Bitcoin and La BitConf in El Salvador. So they invited, La BitConf invited Max and Stacy to be speakers. So they were like, okay, let's go and let's organize a party. So, so I, they asked you to come along with them and yeah. help with the logistics yes, and the other things. Yeah. So we did a party in Palo Verde and it was very good. And what did your family members and your friends in Mexico think of you going to El Salvador? Did My, that seem weird to them or were it, they like, oh, that's great? It was that, yeah, okay. It's okay, yeah. Uh, uh, because also my closest family members were in the same uh, position. Like they were, they didn't have like neither a positive or a negative uh, opinion about El Salvador. It was rather like El Salvador. Okay, yeah, <laughs> sounds really weird. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, but um, after coming here, my first impression was really good. I felt almost like in Mexico, like in the south of Mexico. We are in the same coast of the Pacific. Yeah. It felt for me really good. And after hearing about all the negative things, I'm kind of used to that, those kind of comments about uh, your country, because also people talk a lot of bad things about Mexico with a narco state and stuff yeah. like that. And they would, they would tell foreigners not to come to Mexico because they will be beheaded or they will, they will see blood all over the streets and stuff like that. I'm like, no, it's not true. That happens, but it happens in the very specific areas where you don't go into those areas, right? Uh, so I'm used to... So you didn't to, have any concerns about coming down I here? I didn't have any okay. concerns yeah. at all. I was, let's go, it's perfect. And even being here, it felt really... I felt in my in my environment, it yeah. was... It feels a lot like this, like like Oaxaca, like Guerrero, like the south, south, southern part of Mexico. Uh, I didn't have any concerns at all, unlike most of the uh, foreigners coming. Well, I think even Max and Stacy were kind of freaked out when <laughs> yeah, they first they were came. At first, yeah. And, and now they're the biggest champions of here. So. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, El Salvador does that. It changes a lot of your perspectives of, of things and mostly the people. Yeah. Uh, in general, people is are, are so good, so welcoming, so friendly, uh, so helping. And that helps a lot, of course, because the place can be really good. But if the people are not yeah. friendly, well, you won't feel you won't feel welcomed. So as a foreigner, you felt really welcomed here and and you know, didn't feel out of place, but you felt like the people welcomed you in to be part of the community. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, m- I first met Chimbera, Roman, uh, during the conference week, and I wanted to introduce him to Max and Stacy. So that's how we got in touch first. And that was the conference in El Salvador. Yeah. Okay. In La yeah. BitConf. Yeah. But we met here in El Sonte. Okay. We stayed in El Sonte for four days, then went to the city for the, the, the conference and then came back to El Sonte. So our, during our stay here, uh, we arranged uh, the introductions. They met. And they basically recorded a, a Kaiser report with, with Chimbera. Okay. So that's how we met. And you were handling all their like sound and setting all their stuff up yeah, for them. Yeah, helping them with yeah. the setup. And logistics stuff. and logistics. stuff, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And some translations also. And uh, basically that, that was it. And um, then you were doing that for a while with them, right? I remember because I think even in Miami the next, you know, like five or six months later, I remember 
being with you and Stacy and Max mm -hmm. and and you were helping with them some stuff there. Yeah. So for for a while you were, yeah. were helping them with yeah, things. for a few months. Yeah, it was a few months, not even a, a whole year. Okay, because uh, we were coming after the the BitConf week. We came in 2022 for two months, uh, going back and forth, mostly in San Salvador because Max and Stacy decided to really come and invest most of their time here. They really, really are the champions now, yeah. but they really set it to, to become the champions here, to really talk good things about El Salvador, to find out what's, what, what was going on here really. And uh, the Bitcoin law, of course, it's what brought us here, or at least Bitcoin brought me here, but I'm staying for, for the people, for Hope House, that we can get into that later. Um, and uh, yeah, I was with them for a few months, uh, almost a year, mostly. And after that, uh, after being here and meeting all the people, I was very, very, I felt very welcome. I felt like almost in, in, in the southern part of Mexico. Uh -huh. um, and also, um, I kind of uh, like to talk to people and to ask questions and to, to be friendly myself. So that's normally what you get in return. I, yeah. I think so. Um, no, I remember Roman saying, he's like, hey, we, we need somebody to help with all these things. There's just so many different things going on with the Bitcoin project. And we're also feeling some strains at Hope House with all the community projects we have going on. And so we want to kind of have them be able to just focus on these community efforts, but maybe bring somebody else in on the Bitcoin side. And he specifically mentioned you. He's like, hey, I think uh, Max and Stacy are leaving for a while and, and Paco's here. And I don't think he really has any plans at this point. Maybe we could see if he'd be willing to, to come on you know, board with, with Bitcoin Beach and start helping with all these things. And he was super excited. I think you guys had already been doing a number of things together. Um, you know, Roman is usually the the lead and the head of those things. I'm I'm usually more behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and so he, you know, just saw how valuable an asset you were. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the fact that you spoke English and Spanish and he understood Bitcoin, all these different things together. And so he's like, "Man, can we can we find a way to to bring Paco on and make it possible for him to stay here?" And so I was like, "Hey." If you think he's the the right person for it, you know, yeah, let's go ahead. And then you know, obviously it's been a great choice and it's been a lot of fun having you as part of the team here. And uh, even when we went to Argentina, it was nice having your your background in the travel business <laughs> because I was able to just turn over all the travel logistics of taking 15 people down to Argentina and mm -hmm. not have to worry about that. So it's been, yeah, for me, it's been super fun just getting to know you kind of seeing your your heart and your um, vision and your caringness for people. Um, but would love to hear from your perspective what you're most excited about that's happening in El Zante, what you spend the most of your time doing, where you see the potential, what your vision is. Is Obviously, I'm throwing out a lot of things here. So yeah, maybe, no. maybe we'll just start with that <laughs> and then we'll, uh, we'll follow up once you've kind of hammer through those things. Yeah, so uh, really what happened is like uh, me and Chimbera hung out in Miami in 2022. Yeah, uh, it was his birthday. So we kind of were together. Oh, he got he, stuck there. He got stuck. There. That's right. I he... was with him when that happened. <laughs> yeah, his, his, his passport. His girlfriend took his passport yeah. <laughs> when she flew to Portland. Correct. Obviously not on purpose, um, but somehow he had left his passport with her. And mm -hmm. so, and then there was some crazy like storm mm -hmm. that held up FedEx. And so he, yeah. he was like stuck in Miami for like another three or four days, yeah. I think. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and you so were there with him. Yo, we celebrated his birthday okay. in Miami. I left one or two days after. He, stood, he stayed there for another two because of these problems. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we like bonded, bonded a little more. The uh, hanging out, not in El Sonte, like outside, uh, being there, we bonded a little bit more. Uh, so that's when, re uh, after that, he, that's when he told me, you know, this, there's this opportunity. This is, we need this help with this stuff. I think you can be uh, helpful with all of that. Would you be willing to come? I was like, okay, yeah, let, let, let me digest it a little bit. And I would also, uh, of course, would need to talk to Max and Stacy about it. Uh, but basically, it's a yes. It's a no-brainer for me. I've always loved the beach. I felt really good here, the vibes. 
Uh, I haven't been a, uh, at that point. I wasn't uh, yet uh, very close to Jorge and Irving up until now. Uh -huh. But at that point, I was like, I'll already, I'll, I just said hi to them. Um, but I wanted to know more. Uh, so after that, I came here to help. The idea was to come for two months or three months maybe and find out what I was going to do after that. Uh, part of the idea was also to understand how the Bitcoin Beach project had been developing here and maybe bring it back to Mexico uh, at some point. But that, uh, that changed really when I, when I stayed here. I really, really understood about the story of the, the history of the country, sorry. Uh, I learned about it, uh, whereas I, before I didn't even know, I couldn't really point El Salvador in the map before, uh, two years ago, really. Like, uh, mo like most people in the world. Like most people, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but I really got into learning about the history of the country and how the Hope House project, like, before like uh, feeling the tank of love of the kids and then it turned into hope house understanding the purpose of that project and how it works and what is the the really uh, the depth of this idea of breaking a vicious cycle and not wanting for the new generations and the next generations to repeat the same story that really really touched me in a different way and that's um, the cycle of there being this desperation, so the parents leaving, usually illegally, to the U.S., no. the kids growing up without their parents around, and so often falling prey to the gangs and joining just because they want a sense of a place they belong to, which has a negative impact to the economy, which means you know, the next generation has to also leave to Correct. go to the U.S. to work. And mm -hmm. so seeing that kind of cut off. Exactly, yes. And it also comes from uh, in a personal... I'm mostly fed up of politicians and of the political system in general, promising always that they're going to save you and they're going to fix things. And really, I'm, I'm fed up of that. With that, uh, I really believe that the real changes come from the grassroots, from the ground up. And I saw that in Hope House. I, then I met Jorge and Irving, and I really, I really felt what uh, what they are doing, I felt it from their hearts. Uh, I've talked to them. Now it's been uh, quite a few months more, but yeah. uh, at that point I was like, no, this is, even if it sounds like a cliche, but this is what really changes the world. This is, even if it looks small, but this is what really makes an impact on humanity and uh, with the love of your brothers. Uh, um, and that's what really made me really, I want to do something here. I want to add value here and to bring wh whatever little experience I have uh, to help uh, this, this project uh, be better and grow and be sustainable. Uh, so that's basically my, my, my feeling. I, that's how I decided to really stay here in El Salvador. El Sonte especially has a really special vibe. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I really love it here. What I've been doing mostly, well, before I started helping with a lot of Bitcoin education, we used to go to schools and we are just like going to take over again. But we go to schools and talk to the kids basically about what's happening in the country because they are used to thinking, oh, well, I'm going to study medicine or being a teacher or being a lawyer, well, like the classic stuff. Yeah. But now what we do is we go to talk to them and, and tell them, listen, Things are changing in your country. You are in high school now. You are in a point where you are going to decide what to study, about to think about your future. But really, we want to open their minds to new things. So what we do is like print, for example, uh, the uh, Bitcoiner jobs, the, the page, the web page. We print out uh, some of the job opportunities that are uh, open and we talk to them about these job opportunities. Most of them are new to them. They don't understand what does that mean. Programming, yeah. UX, backend, some words that for them are really, this is new, but we try to explain to them that this is something new. And a lot of them are like, oh, that, that's interesting. I would like to know more about this. So at least it's, it, it sparkles something in their minds 
rather than thinking about being an accountant or a lawyer, right? Well, and even the, the jobs that aren't directly Bitcoin related, they can now work for foreign companies because they can receive their pay in Bitcoin. Yes. Oftentimes, that's one of the hurdles from people hiring people overseas as contractors or employees is it's such a pain to try to pay them. Where now with Bitcoin and Bitcoin, you know, accepted everywhere here, it's very easy for these companies. So now they can work in something that's not even, you know, directly related to Bitcoin, but the fact that it's a Bitcoin country makes it possible. Yes. And I think they're starting to understand that of, okay, our parents had to actually leave here and go live in the U.S. We could actually enjoy this beautiful place, but still get wages that, that are higher from working somewhere else. And mm -hmm. so... I think that really has shifted the the mindset, and I mean, who who would want to leave here? Even doing this podcast, I'm kind of distracted because <laughs> I can I can see. You know, usually, we we film at night, but we're in the middle of the day right now, and I, I'm watching the waves out here through the crack in the curtain, and you know, it's this beautiful sunny day in the middle of you know in, in the winter in the U.S. or Canada or Mexico. We have this warm, beautiful day with great surf rolling in. And um, I, I think I'd rather be out there surfing right now than, yeah, uh, than recording. Sure. But uh, <laughs> after this, um, yeah, so I can understand you kind of falling in love. But it's not just the scenery. It really is the people, just how warm and welcoming. And it, it just makes life more enjoyable when you're living in that kind of environment. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the most important things that I uh, found here is that everyone is welcoming everyone is friendly they will always say buenas in the street uh, they will it's not maybe that's not really that new for me because it's like a latin thing in general but uh, not not every place you you find this not yeah. even if you are in a latin country a latin american country or even in a mexican city not everywhere you will find such friendliness like in, here in el salvador or in el sonte even uh, I've been really, even now people mock me, they, they have given me uh, nicknames. Uh, one, of the, one of those is Colocho because of my curly hair. The Colocho in Salvador uh -huh. means curly hair yeah. or something like that. And other nicknames that I still need to understand what they mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. okay. They call me Viejo, so, uh, <laughs> which, which if you don't speak Spanish means old man. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, well, but when people start giving you nicknames, yeah. they are getting even friendlier. So they like are getting uh, more confidence with you. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I'm just glad that there's, there's another guy here in town. His his nickname's Feo, which just means ugly. <laughs> so, yeah. so at least they didn't choose that one for me. Um, yeah. yeah. No, I know what you're saying. I mean, you feel like really a part. It's one of the it's one of the few places where you really see expats really integrate within the local community. A lot of places that have expat communities, they kind of are in their own little silo and, and they don't have that much local interaction where you really don't have that on in El Salvador. There's really a natural mixing of, of locals and expats. And as you know, the Bitcoin law has taken place and El Salvador has become an international focus, we've seen a really huge influx of very interesting foreigners from around the world. I mean, it's it's rare that I meet uh, anybody that I don't naturally click with. It's yeah. it's like this self selection of people who embrace freedom and are hopeful and want to help build something. And so, um, yeah, you really have this kind of fun interaction. When I go back to the U.S., there's so much negativity there. Where here, mm -hmm. I just feel like everything's very positive. Yeah, I don't know if you felt that same thing. But. Yes, for sure, for sure, and also because. Uh, I I've met a lot of the expats coming from Canada, Australia, Europe and New Zealand, Nick and James, for example. Uh, it's been it's been an interesting combination because I don't even feel like a foreigner myself, even being a foreigner. Yeah, uh, that's that's really interesting because I can get along with all of these communities of expats and we do barbecues and we they I invite them always to come to Hope House and see for themselves and talk to them about all the projects because it's so humbling to to watch what they have been doing and to see them every day doing it. It's really so, so moving. Uh, so I try to uh, tell them to come, to see for themselves. and uh, But at the same time, I sometimes uh, say to myself, I'm also a foreigner. I'm also an expat, but I don't feel like one. Yeah. So it's really cool. It's really, really cool. No, I mean, I'm, I'm I 
kind of feel the same. Obviously, I've been here for a long time. My kids really feel like they're Salvadoran. I mean, they've grown up here. And yeah, it's just a very welcoming, friendly culture. I think that is actually one of the one of my favorite things about about the country. Yeah. That, and I think that that's a lot of people come for Bitcoin, but they wind up staying because of the people and just the beauty of the country. And, you know, obviously to have a government that's embracing freedom and Bitcoin. And um, that's that's obviously very helpful, too. But yeah. I think that, you know, El Salvador is going to become a m- just increasingly desirable place for people to be. And it's going to be this magnet that draws in, you know, the the best brains and the capital from around the world. And so for me, it's just a blast to kind of be in the middle of that. Yeah, for sure. What um, I think we have some pictures that we can pull up of some of the educational events, but would love to have you kind of run the listeners through what the educational process is when we go out to the schools, how Mm -hmm. that Oh, first, first we got you here on your first, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> your first surf lesson. Uh, yeah, uh, that's me and Chimbera in front of Olas Permanentes. Uh, my first ever surf lesson. I had never thought I would be surfing ever in my life. I never crossed my mind uh, doing surfing. Uh, but when I first came here, he said, Chimbera told me, you have two challenges in your life to become a surfer and to become a coffee drinker, because I told him I, I don't like coffee. And he was like, no, you're in El Salvador, you have to drink coffee. I was OK, I'll take the challenge. So that's our first ever lesson uh, with none other than Chimbera. And yeah, uh, this is uh, part of the things that we do at schools. We just talk to the principal and ask her or him for uh, a space in their day, an hour maybe, uh, to gather the high school kids. Uh, to talk to them basically about, uh, we do mostly three things. Chimbera talks to them as, as a local about what's happening in the country, some life lessons, like they should dare to dream, like the movie, yeah. uh, like there, there's a lot of opportunities in the country. And I talk to them about the job opportunities by itself and some uh, advice for them with a professional experience, uh, life experience. And we also bring, invite some of these expats. We invite uh, people from Canada or, for example, um, Nikki and James have been coming with us too. And yeah, they're uh, from New Zealand. They are from New Zealand yeah. and they have a really cool story that people should check out in the previous episodes of this podcast too. And uh, they talk about why they are here, why they are in El Salvador. And the, the overall message is you should be really proud now of your country, of being a Salvadoran, because tables are turning. I, I like to think about it like that. And I almost uh, I tell them like this, tables are turning. Uh, we Latin Americans or even Salvadorans used to go try or want to go out of the country and now these people are wanting to come in so you should be proud of that you should feel proud of being a salvadoran and work for that dream uh whatever you want to do it's really possible now now you are on a point in time where you can decide what you want to do and there are a lot of opportunities if you take them because things are not for free yeah so you have to take those opportunities they are coming so be prepared for that and uh, we are here to help you in any way we can. So this is mostly what we do. We talk to them about these, these things. This is a small school in, uh, school in Sonsal, and this is a high school in La Libertad, which is, I think, the, the largest school in the area, in the La Libertad area. Uh, and, and yeah, we were talking, uh, we do some activities also to like to teach them how to grab an opportunity. Uh, don't be afraid of making a mistake, for example. We tell them uh, we had this um, activity now. Some of you took the opportunity. Some of you were afraid of standing up or saying, speaking your mind. So why? What hold you? What, what holds you back of taking a step further of what you want to do? So that's kind of the activities that we do in the schools here with the kids. Uh, and after that, we show them. Um, uh, we give them Bitcoin. Basically, if they don't have a wallet, we help them download it. We give them a donation in Bitcoin and help them transact with each other. And that's usually the expats that come along. They'll help 
you know, go back and forth. They'll yeah. pass Bitcoin back and forth between the wallets. If, yes. If they need help setting their wallet up, they'll help them with that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. I've, I've participated in a few of those. Mm -hmm. And it's just fun seeing the kids like, wow, it's that quick. It's that yes. easy. So. Yeah. So for most of them, it's exactly eye opening to see. Yeah. Wow, is it really like that? Because in, in the examples that we do, uh, I tell them, for example, now you are doing it with the person that you, are, you have in front of you. But imagine that this person now is in the United States. It's exactly the same process. It takes exactly the same time, less than a second, to send money from here to that, from this phone to that phone, wherever in the world you are. And they're like, really? Just like that? For them, technology is natural. Yeah. But money, not. Yeah. Being so, able to transfer money over technology is, is not right. because you don't have Venmo or, or PayPal or any of those things available here. Like in most of the world, those those services aren't available. Yeah. Uh, so for them, this really is revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And then even from there, they can go to something like BitRefill and recharge their phone or pay their bills for their parents mm -hmm. or, you know, it's yeah. just kind of fun for them to realize this whole world that that yes. opens up to them. Yeah. Um, so they, some of them start asking questions. Some of them start, oh, and how can I do this? And how can I do that? So we are like, okay, we are here to help, but also study for yourself. Investigate. You, you can use Google. Yeah. And we will give you some resources for you to read and find out more. So what, um, uh, other than the, the classes, what, what, what are you most excited about that, that you're able to participate in? I mean, is it... Where do you see like in this next year you wanting to make the focus and yeah uh, well we have also projects in education bitcoin education i've been helping uh this week this past week for example uh we went to the school in el sonte it was such a great experience for me to watch also because i was here last year when the minister of education came and talked to jorge and irvin and all the hope house uh, members team members and he was listening to the project. He was here and we went to the school in El Sonte, which, by the way, as a, as a background, El Sonte school didn't have a, a high school. Yeah, the kids had to travel outside of town if they wanted to travel. Part of the school. problems of the area was yeah. that kids were, had to travel and it was a problem until Hope House helped them with the transportation and with the, uh, a, a little bit of um, allowance. Yeah. And uh, but now the minister promised in the school publicly that he was going to help build the high school in El Sonte. And finally, they did it. And this last week on Monday was the first day of school and the first day of high school uh, for uh, for El Sonte. So they were so proud of that. And I think these kind of things are really underappreciated by the even by the Bitcoin community, because they, they these are not things that they are fully aware of, of what's happening here. And those are the things that I think that have a huge impact further down in in, or in the future, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so those are the kind of things I, I am really excited about. And also the Bitcoin education, which is very important uh, for them to understand how how to use it, how to transact. What, what does it mean for them to have Bitcoin as a legal tender, uh, not only as, a, as an asset, but as a currency for them and as a store of value? There are a lot of ways to to see Bitcoin. So for me to to try to help them understand however they need, for me, it's a uh, it's it's really good. Yeah, and I think one of the, the neatest things about El Salvador that you don't see in other places, especially richer countries, is is Bitcoin really is a currency, how people live daily life. Obviously, not everybody, but but in especially in communities like El Zante, it's very easy to live your life on Bitcoin and you have this circular Bitcoin's economies that keep kind of growing. And one of the projects that originally I was kind of skeptical on, but now I'm very excited about is introducing the Bolt cards um, mm -hmm. here in El Salvador. Because initially I felt like, ah, oh, that's just kind of trying to replicate, like having a card like you do in the US and we're, you know, why are we trying to be like that? Uh, what's wrong with how it works now? But as I start thinking deeper about it, one, for our, our really pushing the schools, it's been a challenge because a lot of the schools will not let the kids have yeah. phones at school, which I totally appreciate and, and I'm actually for. I I'm, want us to not have our kids on these devices all the time. So 
obviously it's hard to teach Bitcoin and, and push Bitcoin adoption if the people can't use use their phone. So that's been one of the hurdles. Also, there's there's people that don't have smartphones. You know, most families have at least one, but a lot of times the kids don't. And so even if the parents can use Bitcoin, they can't really give their kids Bitcoin to spend on lunches or things like that. But with the bolt cards, you basically like bypass these two big problems. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't matter if phones are permitted or not, as long as they have their, their card that has sats on it. But also for families that only have one phone, they can, you know, put a, you know, 20,000, 50,000 sats on their kid's card in the morning yeah. so they can buy a snack at school. Mm -hmm. And really we don't have to worry about anymore about whether or not everybody has phone or if they have internet on their phone, all those things. And so um, obviously there's going to be hiccups and things along the way, but it's, for me, it's exciting. And I'm kind of proud that once again, El Zante is like at the forefront of this. And I really think will be the proving grounds to show that the, the bolt cards are going to play an integral role in making sure we bootstrap these circular economies. And of course, I like to, to delve in the high level things because, you know, the details are always messy. So that's why I love the fact that uh, you're the one that has to worry about yeah. the details of all of that. that. Yes. You're the one that is, uh, I know initially what they brought to us, we looked at and said, no, that's way too complicated. We can't expect people to re recharge their cards or put sats on their cards like this. We have to make it user Very friendly. Easy. And so... I think the lessons learned here are really going to have ripple effect around the world. Yes, but absolutely. That's a very cool project. Uh, we're working with Tianqi, with Darwin from Tianqi app, which they which already, I love that it's a Salvadoran yeah, company. They, are, and they already developer. have like a great, great uh, business model. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's Salvadoran, this Salvadoran company, and they are all for Bitcoin adoption, especially focused on merchants which is also super important, like he mentioned also in the podcast, for making a circular economy throughout the country. So the, they are working on the technical part and uh, we are working on the user part and helping with the uh, onboarding first the El Sonte area and then bringing it further to the rest of the country. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah, so that hopefully in you know six months from now, when people come to El Zante, one of the first things they do is is buy one of these these cards and send some Bitcoin to it, and then yeah. they don't even have to worry about bringing their phone with them, or they could also use one of the bracelets or the ring. So you could walk out, go surfing, come in, and tap your ring on something and buy your cup of coffee. Yeah, that's so. an amazing feature because even I'm not a surfer, but I've I've had this. No, you're a surfer now. <laughs> you're a surfer now. <laughs> I've had this problem that I go to the water and when I come back, I like want to drink a frozen or whatever. And I don't have my phone obviously with me, yeah. so I can't do it. But with this card, it would be so easy to just bring the card with me. It can go underwater, I presume. And so it would be really easy to spend some money coming out of the water instantly. So yeah. yeah. No, I think there's there's all kinds of in, you know exciting implications of mm -hmm. us rolling this out and it's one of those things where you need the network effect of enough users to make it worthwhile for the stores to to have that tap ability and for also they need to have enough stores that are accepting it to make it worthwhile for them to carry their cards and so that's why I think it's these purposeful circular economies that that shows and proves that these things can work because mm -hmm. otherwise i think it would be hard enough to get enough momentum or network effect to have that really grab on but i think if we can push this out in el zante and make it so you can use it everywhere it'll just keep growing out from here to the rest of el salvador and then beyond the borders and so i think it really will have its its genesis here in el salvador yeah um I know another thing that you're really focused on is the Bitcoin meetups and and really just welcoming people when they come into El Zante, new Bitcoiners that are here, helping them learn the ropes. Curious as to kind of, you know, just any insights you've had of what type of people are coming here. Are they mostly just visiting, passing through? Are people deciding to move here after they've been here? Or are they just moving here without even you know, visiting first or what's been your interaction mm -hmm. with Bitcoiners? Yeah, so we've been organizing these meetups uh, every, once a month. Uh, 
the first one was in May of last year, actually, when I got here first. Uh, and we've been doing it once a month. The purpose is just to gather people, talk about Bitcoin, invite some guests and speak about what they are doing in the country, sometimes foreigners, sometimes locals. And most of the time they are just sharing their experience. Who attends these Bitcoin meetups? Mostly Bitcoiners, but we have had also people, curious people that happen to be at the place, at the venue at that moment. And they're like, oh, I'll just sneak around and see what they are, these guys are talking about. And even in one of the meetups, I think in October, there was these two couples from Germany. They were they had no idea. Absolutely. They were just here surfing. They were happening to be there. They stayed and they really they with the raffles, we do some raffles, giveaways of shirts and these Blockstream Jade's uh, hardware wallets. One of the girls won a hardware wallet. So we managed to orange peel them. And they were like, okay, this sounds really interesting. I'm curious. I want to learn how to use it. So the purpose is basically that, to yeah. put together people, uh, talk about Bitcoin, mingle. And uh, if we can orange peel a couple, even if you save one person, you save the world, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, and I'm always amazed at how full the meetups are. I mean, people come from all over El Salvador for, for those yeah. meetups. But even when we're not having an official meetup, it kind of feels like, you know, I always tell people this, maybe it's getting old, but for me, it, it really doesn't get old because it does feel like you're at a Bitcoin conference 24 seven. You're yes. just running into people, you know, some, some people that you don't know, but other people that you know from Twitter and, you know, a lot of the, the Bitcoin personalities that most everybody would know, but it's this interesting mix of, um, just people that are excited about what's happening here. And it's, yeah. It's a really comfortable environment to get to know other Bitcoiners. And you have a lot of people come here who'd never really known other Bitcoiners in real life that, you know, are here. They don't want to leave because they're like, ah, oh, it just feels so natural. Like they found their tribe here. So yes, I don't sure. know if you I'm, feel like that. at yeah, all. Absolutely. But. Absolutely. Some some people that already live in San Salvador, for example, if they needed an excuse to come to El Sante, we give them the excuse. Yeah. And a lot of people here that come without knowing. I, I like to tell them, be careful because people that come to El Sonte, they don't want to leave. So be prepared for that. You're going to stay here, most likely. No, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, I have dozens of stories of people who plan to be here for a week or three days that a year later, they're still here. So I always warn people, you know, yeah, uh, well, you, you might not make it out. In so. a way, you could say that it's my case. I, yeah. came, I came here in May, June for two or three months maybe to see what was going on. And in January that I came, I said, this is my home now. Everyone told me, welcome to your new family. This is your new home. So I'm just, it's my case. I'm here And now. you live actually right there at Hope yeah. House. Yes, so which is fantastic. You're in I the middle it. of it all. I live it all. I love it there because I, I can feel and breathe and smell everything that's going on there. Uh, I'm also, I also help sometimes in, in the surf activities with Surf Para Todos, with the kids. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, uh, that's whatever, whatever the community needs from me. I'm, I'm so happy to, to help in and participate in. So we have kind of a constant influx of people that are coming in that want to help with the projects. They're, they're here, they want to participate, they, they really want to get their hands dirty in it. And sometimes it's been a little challenging for us to have the bandwidth to figure out, okay, if you're only here for a short time, you know, this would be helpful or, you know, where we can kind of plug them in. So since you're more on the ground for, for people who are looking to come down and participate in Hope House, uh, whether it's for a week or a year, do you have any recommendations on, on what they should do or who they should reach out to beforehand? Yeah, what I've seen is that sometimes if I if I bring them to Hope House, what I like to do is like I talk to them about the project and my experience. And I like to all, always introduce them either to Jorge or Chimbera or even whoever is at that moment in, in Hope House. So I introduce to them, just these are the founders of this project, talk to them. And if for, what I've seen is that sometimes if they are uh, foreigners, uh, they can help in the English classes, for example, yeah. because they come and in, during the English class, 
now the kids can talk to a native English speaker and they can practice the language, the pronunciation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes also if they are staying for longer, they they are able to come to Surf Para Todos, for example, on, on Saturdays and help with organizing the kids, with taking care of them by the beach or with the activities. Actually, this past uh, month, a couple of girls from France that are working as volunteers in, in a hostel here, they came to Surf Para Todos. They've been helping a lot. They have been so nice with their activities. They help uh, taking care of the kids. So these are, these are the kind of things that I've seen that people can help with because we need hands, of course, yeah. hands to help. And if they can give some time with helping with the kids, with the activities, with the classes, that's what I've seen they can, they can do for sure. Yeah, that's kind of what I always tell people is, it's just come and show up to these things and, and find the place because it's, it's hard to figure out or organize it all be, be, you know, beforehand. Yeah. But if they just show up and are flexible and are willing to do what's needed, they always find the place yes. where they can you know, really be useful. And, and obviously it adds so much to their trip when they can engage with the local community and get to know all these people. And um, you know, they, they always leave feeling you know, so blessed as being part of it. But sometimes people want to have it all planned out ahead of time. And that's just kind of challenging. Yeah. So we just tell people, hey, show up, be flexible, and, and you'll find your niche. Yes, yes, absolutely. Is there um, anything uh, that you think that we haven't covered today that you would want people to know about El Salvador, or about your own journey? Um, obviously, give people your, your Twitter handle so they can follow uh, you on Twitter. But I don't know if there's any other things that, that you want to kind of promote or let people know about. Well, yes, I am on Twitter as Paco underscore Colocho, actually, because I changed my handle to to be like felt more Salvadoran <laughs> with my nickname, with a local nickname. I used to be more active on Twitter before. Uh, right now, not that much. I mostly retweet stuff from Hope House or from Bitcoin Beach or from Chimbera, etc. Uh, mostly, uh, I don't I don't post any more original stuff if you would if you would like uh but yeah i i'm i'm there on twitter and not really not personal other stuff i'm just really working with uh helping the project go forward in in everything um i think we is have there a way that people can reach out to you if they want to get information is there a way for them to connect uh, email or um, Twitter message? Or yeah, what, Twitter, what? my DMs are open on okay. Twitter. I live Perfect. at Hope House, so mostly they can find me there at Hope House or online, yeah, by Twitter, via Twitter. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, basically that's it. This is this is us uh, having a very really nice lunch with the Hope House team. Uh, I don't remember the name of the place, but it was really nice. Fresh seafood uh, up there, like two kilometers. Okay. Up, up yeah, the coast. yeah. Yeah. There's so many wonderful restaurants yes. here all with uh, beautiful views. The view is amazing. Yeah. 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 That was last year, I think in October. Or something. Okay. Do we have, uh, we have any other pictures there to, to show? Oh yeah. This is the, one of the biggest meetups we did. It was the celebration of the one year anniversary of the Bitcoin day in September. I remember that. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, we invited the Minister of Tourism, the Minister of Economy and the Minister of Education. Yep. They were here and even the press was here, presidency. Uh, it was a very good event to celebrate, of course, the, the one year anniversary of the announcement of the, of the no, of the, of the law. Of the law, the yeah, law. The, the enactment. Yeah. yeah. It was a, it was a very good turnout. Oh yeah, that one. <laughs> well, it was really paparazzi. Uh, that's me on Surf Para Todos on a Saturday. We were doing a, a, the activity with the pastor. Uh -huh. that he comes every Saturday. Uh, I don't know why, why I was laughing. <laughs> they caught me yeah. laughing. You, you look like you're having fun. <laughs> it was something fun. I don't know. <laughs> the kids made me laugh a yeah. lot. Yeah. Well, so, they do that. They're I mean, so, uh, so nice. You, you found your home, your yes, natural environment. Absolutely. Yeah. This is me. This is my element. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you feel more home here than you do in Mexico. Now. Yeah, actually, in December, I went to Mexico for the holidays uh, to spend Christmas with my family, with my mom and my brothers. And it felt weird. It really felt weird. I'm, I'm, I'm a city boy or used to be a city boy, but really Mexico City didn't feel any more like home for me. It felt gray, yeah. if you will. 
uh, crowded, uh, cold. Nah, no, <laughs> it, it, no, I don't belong there anymore. So yeah. this is home for me now. So thank you for having me. No, it's been a blessing to us to, to have you, you here, to have you on the team. It's been amazing to be able to, to work with you and, and fun to kind of delve into your story a little bit here on the podcast. So we'd invite everybody, come to El Zante, you will meet Paco, <laughs> take him to coffee, take him to lunch, um, hear kind of some more of his insights here. And uh, yeah, make sure that you continue to support the work that of Hope course. House is doing here. Absolutely. So. Happy to. All right. Thanks, Paco. Thank you.